Hello, everybody, and uh, welcome to another Tubigen Neuro Campus talk within the Worldwide Neuro Initiative. My name is George Cafedzis. I'm currently a master's student in the lab of Thomas Euler here in Tubigen, and soon to be a PhD student with Tom Baden. As your host for today, I would like to first and foremost thank uh, the organizers, Tim Vogels and the rest of his team, for putting forward this very initiative towards a greener uh, and much more accessible seminar world. And of course, getting back to the reason we all gathered here for today, it is with great pleasure that I introduce our invited guest, Professor Michael Trido. During his uh, PhD with Bruce Bean at Harvard Medical School, Michael Trido was investigating the electrical properties of cells of the basal ganglia, and upon completion, he joined King Wai Yo at John Hopkins University, where he channeled his research on intrinsically photosensitive retinal ganglion cells, IPRGCs. Currently, as an assistant professor of neurology at Harvard Medical School and a member of the Kirby Neurobiology Center at Boston Children's Hospital, he focuses on vision and its impact on the organism's uh, physiology. Uh, for their research, they exploit electrophysiological together with optical techniques in order to investigate uh, specializations in fovea-bearing species, while at the same time actively pursuing his postdoctoral research interest, namely the function of IPRGCs. Uh, today, he will be presenting to us their latest and I'm sure exciting findings in his talk entitled Sensing Light for Sight and Physiological Control. Without any further ado, please all welcome Professor Do, the stage is yours. All right, well, thank you for very kind introduction. It's really a pleasure to be here speaking at Worldwide Neuro. Uh, let me try to share my screen and make sure that goes out, uh, goes fine. How's that? The screen is visible and the mouse is moving in a... Yes, like, everything is okay. Okay, great. Well, it's a really, it's really a pleasure to be here and I appreciate all of you tuning in. Uh, for those of you who, who tuned in uh, a few weeks ago only to find an empty space, I apologize for that. Something came up at the very last minute that I just could not avoid, and so I was forced to uh, reschedule the talk, but thank you for coming back. So before getting started, I, I just wanted to say that it's a particular pleasure to uh, be here at Tomas Euler's invitation. Uh, Tomas and I go way back. I actually met Tomas when I was a first year PhD student, bright eyed and, and uh, obsessed with the retina, I came to do a rotation in Dick Mazin's lab where Tomas was a postdoc at the time. And so I did my, my very first retinal dissection under his watchful eye. I worked on his electrophysiology and, and optical rig. And through uh, the conversations that we had, I learned a great deal about how to think about retinal circuitry and, and not just retinal circuitry, but circuitry in general. So uh, one of the principal goals of this talk is uh, not to embarrass Tomas, and I hope I pull that off. <clears throat> In that spirit, uh, I'd rather be clear than to make it through each and every slide. So if you have questions, if, if you know something was lost in transmission here, please post uh, questions so that I can address them later. If you must have an answer right away, maybe be emphatic in your question, type it in all caps, and perhaps the host will let it through and interrupt me. Okay, so, the title of the talk, as, as George said, is Sensing Light for Sight and for Physiological Control. And let me unpack that for you. So when we think about light, we often think about our own visual experience. And certainly this is a, a principal uh, role played by the visual system. And if I could get my slide to advance, here it is. So uh, the side of the visual system that we use to uh, recognize objects and guide our actions uh, to have these daily experiences of the world is often called image vision. And that's because it's tasked with, re with resolving patterns in the world, patterns in, in space so that we can see uh, detail, patterns in time so that we can see uh, events unfold dynamically, and patterns in other domains too, like wavelengths so that we can uh, discriminate color. Now, less intuitive is a, is a side of the visual system that is quite unconcerned with images and patterns. And we refer to this as non-image vision or, or non-image forming vision. And this side of the visual system is more concerned with sensing the overall light intensity, what we often call irradiance. And irradiance is uh, crucial information for regulating many aspects of physiology. For instance, we all have within us a circadian clock that allows us to anticipate regular changes in the environment that are imposed by the rotation of the Earth. This clock uh, 
uh, regulates gene expression in practically every tissue. And for it to be useful, it has to be synchronized to local time, which of course varies with, with geography and, and with season. So for a talk like this, I was unable to open it by saying good morning. You know, that's where I am here in Boston on the East Coast of the USA, but it's quite different in other parts of the world. So the clock has to be entrained to local time to be useful and by and large, it's light intensity that does this, the overall light level and not patterns in the, in the visual stimulus. Irradiance is also important for regulating other functions like uh, the acute control of sleep and hormones like melatonin. So one of the questions that really guides us is, is how is it that, that the visual system takes a common input, which is light, generates information, and then diversifies that information and reformats it so that it can serve these divergent needs image vision on the one hand, non-image vision on the other. And for this talk, this question is gonna boil down to one of cell types. How are cell types tailored to their roles? Certainly we are uh, awash in, in cell type uh, identification now. Many, many are, are being uncovered through methods like single cell RNA sequencing, but how do they actually serve the organism? what are the functional properties of individual cell types and, and, and how are they suited to, to the tasks at hand? So I'll talk about two cell types with you today, one that's more on the image forming side of things and one that's more on the non-image forming side of things. And the first cell type is the foveal cone photoreceptor. Okay, so these are neurons. They're quite special. They're found only in humans and other primates and they are the origin of our ability to see the world in detail our visual acuity. And our visual acuity is, is quite spectacular. So we can see more detail than, than any other mammalian species known, right? We see 10 times more detail than a cat can, uh, 100 times more detail than a mouse can. And if you broaden your scope of comparison and look across the animal kingdom, uh, we're only outperformed by certain birds of prey like, like eagles and, and hawks. And those animals can see two times more detail than we can, but at any level of any any given level of detail, they need an order of magnitude more contrast to, to resolve that detail, right? So arguably, our visual acuity is, is among the best uh, in the animal kingdom. So how does that arise? Well, it begins with the foveal cones. What are the properties of these cell types? How are they suited to their roles? So I'll explore one aspect of, of the foveal cones with you in the first part of the talk. I'll then move on to the non-image side of things. And I'll talk about the intrinsically photosensitive retinal ganglion cells that George mentioned in his introduction. So these cells are highly specialized for encoding irradiance, the overall light intensity. So in that regard, they're quite different from the foveal cones. They're also different in another way, which is that these intrinsically photosensitive retinal ganglion cells, or IPRGCs, are found in every mammalian species. Every mammalian species that's been examined uh, has these neurons, from humans to uh, other primates to uh, rats and mice and rabbits down to the subterranean mole rat. So the IPRGC gives us an opportunity to look at a conserved cell type and to ask, you know, to what extent is it tailored to the particular needs of the species? So that'll be the second part of the talk. All right, so we can start here. We're gonna go with image forming vision for, for the first arc. And what we're looking at is a view of the human retina and a particularly prominent part of the human retina is this pigmented region in the middle. That's the macula, probably familiar to you from macular degeneration, one of the leading causes of blindness worldwide. And macular degeneration is devastating for vision because it, it kills the fovea. Okay, the fovea is in the very center of the retina. And this is something that's found only in uh, some primate species, including ourselves. So to, to highlight how specialized the fovea is, let me first show you uh, an image from the peripheral retina beyond, uh, beyond this view or at the very edge. So we're switching species. This is now an image from a macaque retina that's uh, isolated, that's alive. It's on one of our electrophysiology rigs ready for analysis. And we're focusing on the layer of rod and cone photoreceptors. We all know from high school uh, that rods are the photoreceptors that we use in dim light primarily. And then the cones are what we use in uh, daylight. So right now, as we look at this slide, we're using our cone photoreceptors. And the cones here are relatively sparse. They're large and they're widely spaced. So this is not a good uh, photoreceptor array for resolving detail. 
in the world. And in fact, uh, when something falls on your peripheral retina, when an image falls on your peripheral retina, you can't, you know something's there, but you can't make out much about it, right? We're in our peripheral retinas, in our peripheral vision, we're, we're legally blind. So if we want to see in detail, we put that image on our fovea. And this is what the foveal photoreceptor array looks like. It's quite different. These images are on the same scale. And here, uh, in the very center of the fovea, there are no rods. These are all cone photoreceptors, and they've shrunken down in cross sections such that each one is minuscule. And the dense packing of these cells makes a photoreceptor array, a pixel array, that uh, you imagine would be very good for resolving details in the world. Okay, so here in this view, uh, we have form and function uh, dovetailed, right? It's, it's quite beautiful in this way. If you take a different view, then, then questions arise. So let's look at the fovea from the side here. And so in the schematic, we're looking at the very center of the fovea in the middle, and you can see that it's a pit, okay? So, so the downstream layers of cells and synapses have been pushed aside so that light has direct access to the foveal cone array. And it's thought that this could sharpen the visual image because you have less scattering of light through, through tissue. However, this poses a challenge. Because the, the downstream cells are pushed aside, now the foveal cone has to extend a long axon in order to make contact. These axons are so extensive that in the foveal region, there's a whole layer that's just cone axons. Some people call these the Henle fibers and the Henle fiber layer. Okay, so why, why is this, this shape of interest to us? Well, here it is in, in more detail. And uh, let me tell you a couple things about these uh, photoreceptors. First of all, they capture light and generate an electrical signal at this end here in the outer segment, this, uh, cellular compartment. Now that electrical response has to propagate through the cell down this long axon, this long and slender axon, to reach the synaptic terminal in order to uh, pass visual information along. So uh, we know that as electrical signals propagate through cables, they tend to get smaller and they tend to get slower. And of course, if they got too small, that would sacrifice visual sensitivity. And if they got too slow, then that would sacrifice temporal resolution and vision. So, so what do signals look like as they travel, right? The, the way that they're shaped by propagation governs the type of information that's available to high acuity vision. Uh, the answer is, well, we don't know, okay? The, the closest that, that, that we have is work from Peter Sterling. Uh, they actually very carefully analyzed the morphology of foveal cones, built a, a circuit model and borrowed parameters, biophysical parameters from, from other cell types. And, and when they put those parameters into the morphology of a foveal cone, what they find is that there's a steep attenuation of the signal as it propagates. So from the outer segment down to the terminal at a frequency, a temporal frequency that's important to vision, say 50 hertz, the signal is attenuated by five-fold. So is it really the case that, that you have to make a relatively large and fast signal here just to have something respectable down here at the synaptic terminal. This started to um, obsess us. And so, so we elected to, to ask, how do signals propagate through these cells? How do they shape visual information? And so we analyzed signal propagation through foveal cones, and, and we also looked at the peripheral cones for comparison. Now, peripheral cones, uh, signal propagation is probably not a big problem here because the cells are short, the signal doesn't have a long way to go, and they're pretty wide, so you have a lot of uh, a lot of highways for current to flow down, right? So uh, this is work that is done by Greg Bryman, who finished his PhD in the lab. Uh, very talented, as you'll see in the experiments that I'll show you. Uh, we were uh, helped a great deal by Andy Liu, a postdoc in the lab who set up uh, all of our work on, on mechanics, mechanic tissue. Okay, so, so when we set out to do this, we thought, let's gain access to both ends of the cell and then we can look at how signals go back and forth, right? So, so we elected to, to pull these cells out of the retina acutely. So this is a, a cone from the periphery of the macaque retina that's been acutely dissociated. And you can see that the preservation is quite lovely here. We have the outer segment, the inner segment, cell body axon, synaptic terminal, and even these long, uh, thin processes, these telodendria that ordinarily reach out to make electrical synapses with neighboring cells. Okay, here's the dissociation that Greg did from the fovea. We're missing the outer segment here, which is typical 
And that doesn't affect any of the conclusions that I'll, I'll tell you about today. I'd be happy to tell you why, but it's missing its outer segment. But here's the inner segment subbody and this long axon that in this case coils out of the plane of focus and then back down again to culminate in the synaptic terminal. And we know this is a terminal we can stain for uh, release machinery and it's there. Okay, so then what does Greg do? He puts one electrode on one end of the cell, the inner segment, and the other electrode on the uh, presynaptic terminal. And he can now study uh, signal propagation through these cells. Okay, so the experimental conditions, uh, I won't belabor them. They're here for the aficionados. Basically, we strive to be as physiological as possible so that the, the information that we get in vivo, uh, we can relate it to, to perception, right? to, to work that's done in vivo. Uh, we've done a number of experiments using this preparation. I'll, I'll focus on one of them. So, you know, you can imagine we can inject current at this site or that site. For the purpose of today's talk, we're only stimulating at the inner segment. And by stimulation, it's typically the injection of electrical current. And then we'll measure the voltage both at the inner segment and at the terminal. Okay, and then by comparing the response of these two sites, we can see what propagation looks like through the cell. Okay, so uh, let me tell you something about the stimulus, which is shown here, right? This is the electrical current that we're injecting into the inner segment. And that's where current usually flows from the outer segment after phototransduction has occurred. So the stimulus that I'm showing you today is Gaussian white noise. Okay, it's current in the form of Gaussian white noise. We like this because it contains a continuum of temporal frequencies so that we can see which frequencies are uh, preferentially encoded by the cell and which frequencies tend to propagate down to the presynaptic terminal. Why look at things varying in time? Well, that's, that's, what a, that's what a photoreceptor experience is. The world is in motion, our eyes are in continuous motion. And so each cell is basically getting a time varying rain of photons, which is converted by phototransduction into a time varying modulation of current, right? So that's what we're injecting here. And I'll be showing a lot of data plotted against temporal frequency. Okay, so here's the, the, the stimulus that's delivered to the inner segment. And then at the, at the inner segment also, we measure the voltage that's shown in black down below. And then at the terminal, we're measuring the voltage and that's shown in red. And what you can see is that the, the response at the terminal is a bit smaller and a bit slower than the response at the inner segment. So propagation is shaping the signal to a degree, but it's mild, right? This is not the five-fold attenuation that we would expect from uh, borrowing biophysical properties from, from other cells and putting them into the structure of a cone, right? So signal propagation through foveal cones appears to be highly effective. This, is a, this shows it to you in, in, in quantitative form. It's probably clearer here. So for quantification, what we do is we, we do a cross-correlation of the response and the stimulus, and then we take the, 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 the magnitude spectrum of that cross-correlation. This is a conventional approach, and that allows us to look at the magnitude of the response on the y-axis as a function of temporal frequency on the x-axis. Okay, inner segment in black, terminal in red, they overlay really well, suggesting that propagation is high fidelity. The overlap is so good that uh, it's easier to look at the ratio. This is the terminal divided by the inner segment. And you can see that there's some drop here, but it's mild, right? So it never falls below, say, 0.9 for, for the cell, even at high temporal frequencies. We can look in the peripheral cone, as we expected, uh, the responses that the two compartments overlay uh, almost perfectly. And you can see that in the quantification here as well. All right, so here are group data. This is going to be our metric of uh, propagation fidelity, which is the magnitude at the terminal versus the inner segment. And then here on the x-axis is the length of the cell. So peripheral cones in brown are short, foveal cones are of varying lengths reaching out to uh, hundreds of microns. Right, and you can see that at a low temporal frequency of one hertz and a high one, 60 hertz, where you know, flicker fusion has happened and we don't see temporal modulations much anymore, at both of these frequencies, uh, propagation fidelity is excellent, right? It doesn't fall below 0.9. Okay, so I should mention that we're showing the magnitude spectrum here. This doesn't tell us much about timing. Uh, we also have done this for phase, uh, response phase, and, and it's basically the same thing. Okay, I'm just omitting it for, for clarity and, and brevity here. Okay, so when you see a signal that, that propagates effectively through a cell of some length, you think, ah, there must be amplification by voltage-gated channels. So the signal is boosted as it travels 
And in, in, in some cases, of course, you have action potentials, which are regenerative and send information over very long distances. Of course, photoreceptors, cone photoreceptors, and rod photoreceptors are, are, don't fire action potentials under normal, uh, under most circumstances. And so they're analog signals. Is there amplification here? Actually, we don't have any evidence that amplification is involved. And we have many lines of evidence saying that it's not involved, that, that voltage-gated channel activity is completely dispensable for effective propagation. So for instance, we can block channels, voltage-gated channels pharmacologically, and we see the propagation is, is not different. Uh, we can voltage clamp the cell so that the voltage-gated channels are, are prevented from gating. We see no difference in propagation. We can take our measurements, build models of these cells that are quite realistic, and uh, we can build them such that they have no voltage-gated channels. They're purely passive. And uh, again, propagation is highly effective. It's not different from, from the, 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 the experimental observations. So, it looks like amplification is not required for effective propagation. And if it's not amplification, then it has to be something about the electrical architecture of the cell, just its nature as a, an electrically conductive uh, device, right? So, uh, or not even a device, a material, an electrically conductive material. So, so what is that? So if we hearken back to uh, neurophysiology 101, uh, we remember that there are three properties that are most important for this question. So one is the specific membrane capacitance. That's how much charge, electrical charge, does it take to change the voltage of a, of a bit of membrane. And of course, the higher this value is, the more so current will be soaked up as it travels and the less will be available to charge distant compartments. So we want to know that. The second parameter is the internal conductivity. So how well does current flow longitudinally through the cell in its interior, right? The, the higher this value is, the more current will spread throughout the cell and, and charge up even distal compartments. And then the last one is membrane conductivity. How much current tends to leak out of the cell and is lost to extracellular space? The higher this is, the less current you have to charge distal compartments. So we, we extracted these parameters in uh, a standard way, which is to record from cells, carefully reconstruct their morphologies, and then build a, a multi-compartmental uh, passive compartmental model of the neuron, right? So we have this in silico representation of the neuron that has realistic morphology as, as an, you know, boiled down to a, an equivalent circuit. And then we take the response that we measure from the cell, fit the model to the response, and that gives us our three free parameters in the model, which are these biophysical properties. Okay, our model has two more parameters, which is just the resistance between the electrode and the cell at these two sites. We do this for dissociated cells, which are well constrained. We have recordings at both sites. We also do it for cells in the intact retina, where the glial and sheathings are, are present. Um, the outer segments are present. They're just in their native habitat. For the purposes of for the purpose of this talk, there are no differences here. Okay, so the things that I'll tell you about appear to be cell autonomous. Okay, all, all the parameters that govern prop propagation through these cells seem to be cell autonomous. Okay, so so what do we find? So when we look at the specific membrane capacitance, we see this value. And this is basically the textbook value. It seems to be that most cells, the lipid dye layer is such that you have a specific membrane capacitance here. Uh, translating to a more familiar unit, one microfarad per centimeter squared. So this is an internal control for analysis. Okay, and it's a bit comforting to see that. And it's the same between peripheral cones in brown, thorial cones in blue of different lengths, all right? What about the internal conductivity? This is the value that we estimate, one microstemen per micron. And how, is that high or is it low? Well, this value has only been estimated uh, once before for the cone photoreceptors of the turtle. And this is work that, that Helga Kolb did. And that value that they estimated is down here, two orders of magnitude lower than what we see in the foveal cones and the peripheral cones of primates. So this seems high. How high is it? Well. You know, we know that the, the cone photoreceptor is, is, contains organelles, right, uh, and cytoskeleton. And so these could provide uh, impedance, uh, impediments to, to the flow of ions. But if we compare the internal conductivity that we estimate for the cones with the conductivity of just a beaker of saline, we find that they're very similar, right? So even though the current within these cells has to flow past these intracellular structures, 
it flows as if those structures really aren't there, right? Okay, so it seems very high. What about the membrane uh, conductivity? Well, here we see a divergence between the peripheral cones and the foveal cones. The foveal cones have much lower membrane conductivity, suggesting that much less current is lost in the extracellular space and more is present to travel down the length of these much lengthier cells and then charge the presynaptic terminal. All right, so uh, we've done experiments to look at what underlies this divergence in membrane conductivity, and I'm, I'm not showing them here, but I'll, I'll just summarize. It looks like most of this difference in membrane conductivity can be accounted for by the, 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 the activity of voltage-gated currents. So we looked at two of them, IH, the hyperpolarization activated cation current, and uh, IKX, a, a prominent potassium current in photoreceptors. And together, they account for about 60% of the difference in membrane conductivity between peripheral and foveal cones. So it looks like the foveal cones are downregulating down their, their uh, voltage-gated current activity in order to keep current inside. All right, and, and this is opposite of, of what uh, we often think about for propagating signals over distance. You have voltage-gated channels to amplify the signal or even generate uh, action potentials. Uh, here, it's the lack of voltage-gated channels that is allowing signals to propagate over distance. Okay, so, so these parameters look really well-tuned to propagate signals through these long and slender foveal cones are they optimal? Can they be made better? And so the way that we did this analysis is to build what we call a reference cone. And so this, this reference foveal cone is designed to be among the most slender and long that have been observed in nature in our hands and, and in other experiments. And so now we can give this reference foveal cone the internal conductivity that we measure here at one X here on the one and the X axis and the absolute value is shown down below. And now we can systematically vary that parameter and ask what happens to the uh, magnitude at the terminal versus the IS, right? What happens to uh, propagation fidelity? And what we see is that you can't really make it that much better, right? You can, you can increase the internal conductivity, but the gain in, in propagation fidelity is, is quite minimal. And in fact, it's hard to imagine making it better because it's, it's already approaching what, what we find in, in saline, the saline that's like the intracellular environment of the cell. You can't make it much better, but you can make it much worse, right? So if you uh, substitute in the internal conductivity of this turtle cone, for instance, uh, fidelity falls by at least an order of magnitude across temporal frequencies. That's what these various lines are. Okay, we can do the same analysis for membrane conductivity. Again, we can't make things much better uh, by, by reducing membrane conductivity in foveal cones. In fact, if we block all voltage-gated channels in the cell, we get a decrease in membrane conductivity of say threefold. And if you look threefold on this axis barely, barely takes you anywhere in terms of improvement, right? And, and we can't do much better, but we can do a lot worse. So if we just sub in the, just substitute in the, the value for peripheral cones, we find that fidelity has dropped quite a bit. Okay, so it looks like these parameters, it looks like the electrical architecture of foveal cones is, is nearly optimal for propagating signals over distance. And that made us wonder, could, you know, if, if propagation is, is so well-tuned, could we make the cones longer than they are? Could evolution make the cones longer than they are without a sacrifice to propagation fidelity? And, uh, you know, this might seem like a, a bit of a fanciful question to ask, you know, can the cones be made longer? Let me explain uh, why, why we think this is an interesting question to ask. So what I did not mention at the beginning of the talk <clears throat> is that the fovea is a tiny part of the retina. So it, it accounts for less than a percent, less than 1% of the retinal surface area. So we have this uh, experience of a seamlessly detailed visual world, uh, but that's a construction of our minds, right? So, so we are constantly moving our eyes to scan the fovea across the visual scene. And we stitch those little high, you know, high, highly detailed snapshots together. We snitch, stitch them together to form this, this, uh, this, this perception of a richly detailed world. And if the fovea could be made bigger, then we'd have, we'd see more detail in more of the world at any given instant. And you can imagine how that would be advantageous. Okay, so what's involved in making the fovea bigger? Well, it turns out that 
because the inner segments are thinner than the synaptic terminals are, if you add up the inner segments of the foveal cones to get more cones and a larger fovea, that the fovea grows, but then the array of terminals grows even more, right? So, so now to connect the two together, you need longer and longer axons. So if you want a bigger fovea and a more expansive high acuity visual field, <clears throat> you need longer axons in the foveal cones to do it. So uh, can you do it and still preserve propagation? The way that we ask this question is to take our reference foveal cone and now vary axon length. Okay, so this blue band uh, is the range of axon lengths found uh, in foveal cones. These blue dots are the lengths of our reference foveal cone. And as I said, it represents uh, the longest scene. And these curves are uh, propagation fidelity at different frequencies. And you can see that the, the natural lengths stop right where you have this steep decline in fidelity. And that's shown here uh, on the right, which is just the first derivative of these curves, showing you that where the longest cones are is where any change in length is going to give a steep change in propagation fidelity. So we think that we have biophysical parameters here that are, that are, that are helping to constrain the length of the cones and thus the, 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 the size of the fovea. Okay, and this could provide some insight into why it is that if you look at uh, primates, various primate species from marmosets, which are tiny, to humans, which are quite a bit larger, you find that the, the fovea here signified as the, the cone dense region, the fovea is pretty much a constant size, even as the retinal surface area varies by five fold. So we, we propose that, that there are uh, biophysical constraints here to the evolution of larger and larger foveas. Uh, it's not the only constraint, but we suggest that it is one. Okay, <clears throat> so let me summarize this first part of the talk. I provided evidence that signals propagate through uh, cones with high fidelity, uh, <clears throat> despite their slenderness and length. Uh, I mentioned to you that amplification by voltage-gated channels seems to be dispensable for propagation. And propagation is supported instead by passive properties that give rise to the electrical architecture of the cell. One is a high internal conductivity, which is found across uh, foveal and peripheral cones. The other is a low membrane conductivity, which is specific to foveal cones. I also mentioned that this low membrane conductivity specialization of foveal cones comes from uh, a sparseness of voltage-gated channel activity, which uh, is quite the opposite of what you uh, would typically consider for, for neurons propagating signals, right? You'd want, in a typical neuron, more channels to drive amplification. And then finally, I just suggested to you that biophysical mechanisms may constrain the length of foveal cones and thus also the dimensions of the fovea. Okay, so that is the, the first part of the talk. And so now I'll switch over to talk about the second part, which is sensing light for physiological control. Okay, so uh, here we're talking about non-image vision instead of image vision. The requirements are quite different. And we're also now going to be on the other side of the retina. So we've been here among the rod and cone photoreceptors. Now we're going to be on this side with the retinal output neurons, the retinal ganglion cells or RGCs. Now it turns out that not all of the RGCs require rods and cones to sense light. A small population of retinal ganglion cells actually sense light directly because they express a visual pigment molecule, which is called melanopsin. It's a G-protein coupled receptor. It absorbs a photon, undergoes a conformational change, kicks off a cascade of biochemical reactions that ultimately gates an ion channel and activates the cell. Okay, this is what these uh, ganglion cells look like. We call them intrinsically photosensitive retinal ganglion cells, or IPRGCs, also melanopsin cells. We're now in a different species. We're looking at the mouse retina, and this is an immunolabeling done by Elliot Milner, who uh, finished his PhD in the lab. So you can see that these IPRGCs are quite sparse, but they're large. They cover visual space, and, and this large size also helps them to blur out detail in the world to start to extract information about the overall light intensity or irradiance. Okay. If we follow the axons of these cells into the brain, we find 
uh, usual candidates. This is actually just a sample of the brain regions. There are something like 45, 46 total brain regions that are innervated by these neurons in the mouse. So we find some usual candidates like the dorsolateral geniculate nucleus, which is a principal uh, center for image vision. So these cells are not absolutely dedicated to non-image vision, but major targets are, for instance, the oliveric pretectal nucleus, which is uh, involved in pupillary control, and the suprachiasmatic nucleus, which is the master circadian clock of the body. All right, other functions are, are shown here for, for your interest. Now, uh, much work has been done on these cells in the two decades or so since their discovery. And we've learned a couple of things. First of all, uh, these cells are absolutely necessary for irradiance-driven functions like regulation of the circadian clock in the pupil. If you uh, selectively ablate these cells, the clock is completely blind, right? It loses all of its retinal innervation, and the pupil barely functions at all. Also, the intrinsic photosensitivity of these cells is, is very important. If we just consider uh, something like the pupil constriction mediated by the OPN here, if you knock out melanopsin, of course, the rods and cones are still there, the 40 other types of retinal ganglion cells are still there. It's just the IPRGCs are no longer intrinsically photosensitive. What you find is that the pupil can constrict, but then it just stops at, say, 50% of its maximum constriction in steady light. And if you increase light further, it just doesn't constrict any further than that. So uh, this suggests to us that these IPRGCs are most important at high irradiances, right? They actually extend the dynamic range of non-image forming visual functions to high light levels. So how do you encode irradiance? And uh, it's not trivial, and it's not trivial because uh, of this, right? So as the Earth turns on its axis, irradiance varies by many orders of magnitude, 10 orders of magnitude. And so how do you build a system of neurons that uh, has enough dynamic range to encode this full range? Okay, and, and IPRGCs are most important, apparently from the behavioral experiments at highlight intensities, what are they doing there? Okay, so this is a question that, that I'll pose with you in the, in the remaining time for mouse IPRGCs and also macaque IPRGCs to ask how this one cell type may be uh, specialized to the, the, the temporal niche of the species, right? Mice, lab mice being nocturnal and macaques being diurnal. And actually, if you wanted to make this species comparison, say you had a favorite cell type and you wanted to know how does it compare across mouse and macaque, there are not that many opportunities that we, we know of now, okay? So here, Here's a, a paper that was published recently by Josh Staines and Aviv Rogev, and you know, we had a small role to play in it. One of the take home messages is that if you look at the conservation of cell types between mice and macaques, it's very high in the outer retina, say among the photoreceptors, but then as soon as you get down to the ganglion cell level, it's dwindled dramatically, such that if you compare macaque types, whoa, sorry about that. If you compare macaque types to mouse types, you find that there's little correspondence. These dots are sort of all over the place, except for a handful of cell types. And here at the very top of the list are the IPRGCs. Okay, so we have an opportunity here to ask, how do these cells establish dynamic range in the irradiance encoding for nocturnal and diurnal species? And you might imagine that it's different. Okay, we can make, we can make the comparison uh, between apples and apples, we think, because if we look at the IPRGCs in the mouse, and in those of primates, we see one that is uh, quite orthologous at the morphological level. So in the mouse, these are called M1s. They're easily uh, identified because they put their dendrites in a very specific place in the retina, the, the outermost layer of the inner plexiform layer. Okay, so the outer stratifying IPRGCs in the mouse, there is an orthologue in the primate, and so we can uh, compare these two. Okay. So let's start with the mouse. And this is an experiment that Elliot Milner did. This work was published in 2017. So again, I won't belabor the details. Right now, we're going to look at cell intrinsic properties. So we're blocking synaptic transmission. Things aren't that different if we leave synaptic blockers out. We recognize these cells in the mouse because we have a reporter mouse, uh, TD tomatoes driven in these neurons. We take pains to dark adapt. Our conditions are as physiological as we can make them. Um, we strive to, to uh, do experiments in a way that we can match in vitro to the uh, in vivo cases, and we've done some in vivo um, 
controls as well that, that bear out what I'm about to tell you. Okay, so we're interested in, in irradiance encoding and we're interested in dynamic range. So this is the stimulus that Milner concocted. We're gonna give steps of light from the threshold intensity that just evokes spiking in these cells up to 10,000 fold threshold and then back down again to look at reversibility. And this is a preferred patch recording from the cell body. Okay, so first let's look at the phototransduction current. This is as close as we can get with our electrode to the phototransduction cascade. You can see that it has a pretty simple dependence on irradiance. If we look at the steady photocurrent, it just grows as light intensity grows and then falls as light intensity falls. So if we had access, if the brain had access to this phototransduction current, it would have a decent sense of what the light intensity is out there, but it doesn't, right? What the brain has access to are the action potentials that are sent down the optic nerve. <clears throat> so what do the action potentials look like? Here's the same cell now recorded in, uh, in current clamps so we can look at the voltage and you can see something kind of funny, which is that uh, as the light intensity increases, the spike rate increases, that's fine. But then as the light intensity increases even further, spiking dwindles uh, and then falls into silence. Okay, it looks like the phototransduction current becomes so big that the membrane depolarization becomes so large that the spike generator is blocked. The cell goes into a highly, a deeply refractory state. This depolarization block is something that you tend to see in uh, disorders of hyperexcitability like epilepsy. And yet here we have these cells generating it using their own phototransduction cascade. So this is puzzling because uh, one, we thought that these cells contributed dynamic range to non-image vision, but look, the range of irradiances over which the cell uh, acts is quite narrow. And then we thought they were especially important at highlight levels, but here the highlight level is, is driving these cells into block, right? They're silenced. Let me just show you what those spikes look like, right? So as the depolarization grows with the light level at a certain point, the, the amplitudes fall down into noise. So uh, we have a puzzle on our hands. Uh, how do these cells actually encode irradiance? Let me just make that a bit clearer with these plots. So the photocurrent has a monotonic dependence on light intensity. It's a good readout of irradiance. Same thing with the membrane voltage if you cut out all the spikes. But now if you look at the spike rate, it's this bell-shaped curve. So if you're, let's say you're a neuron in the suprachiasmatic nucleus trying to figure out what uh, light level is, uh, you know, how bright the environment is, and you're listening to this cell and the cell is quiet, is that because it's dark outside or because there are more than a million photons per micron squared per second? It's ambiguous, all right? So what's the solution? It seems to be a, a population representation of irradiance. Okay, so individual IPRGCs, outer stratifying IPRGCs are narrowly tuned to irradiance relatively. And there's some ambiguity in that uh, two irradiances can give you the same firing rate. But if you look across the population, now we have differential tuning to irradiance and collectively these cells represent light intensities from moonlight to full daylight, fully autonomously. Okay, so uh, we are quite struck by this. And you know, one thing that's striking is that this is one anatomical cell type, as far as we can tell, and yet the sensitivity varies over a larger span than, than the difference between rods and cones, right? That's the canonical division of labor in the visual system between low light vision and daylight vision. So one cell type that seems to be doing it more than that, uh, just by itself. So many questions arise from this, you know, what is what are the mechanisms here that give rise to differential tuning? Um, how are these signals processed downstream in the brain? We're looking at that. We're going into the suprachiasmatic nucleus, into the olivary pretectal nucleus, imaging activity in the boutons of these cells and postsynaptic neurons to, to ask, you know, how is this information used? But for now, uh, I'll discipline myself and stay on target and talk about how this compares with macaques. Okay, so, so you might imagine macaques being diurnal and mice here being nocturnal, that, that this scheme might be different. To ask that question, we have to identify the macaque IPRGCs. And that's difficult. We, we're not in a position to make transgenic macaques, right, to, to label these cells. But we can collect tissue from macaques that, you know, have reached the end of other studies uh, here in the Boston area. And that's tissue that would ordinarily be discarded. So is there a way to, to find these cells in that tissue so we can study them? And we thought, well, melanopsin is the defining characteristic of these neurons. It has this extracellular N-terminus that has no ascribed function. 
let's tag it with a fluorescent antibody and label these cells. Okay, so it's risky because melanopsin activity is something that we're interested in. But I'll tell you, we've done a, an extensive series of control experiments that suggest that melanopsin properties are not affected by antibody binding. So we don't think that at least the things that we're studying here, we have no evidence to suggest that anything that we're studying here is perturbed by, by this immunotagging approach. And, and we hope that as we analyze all the single cell RNA data that, that we can find you know, more innocuous targets. But here, um, it looks to be an innocuous procedure and it works, right? So here uh, are melanopsin cells that are alive stained in the macaque tissue. We can see them. Now we can put our electrodes on them and ask, how do they encode irradiance? Is it similar to what the mice, mouse melanopsin cells are doing? Again, this is, this is Andy Liu again, who has spearheaded this work in, on macaque IPRTCs, uh, helped by Elliot Milner, who uh, continued his interest in irradiance encoding by these cells. So uh, I know we're, we're, the clock is ticking, so let me just quickly go through this with you. You can see that we see a similar thing, right? So this cell uh, is unimodally tuned to irradiance. And as the light intensity increases, the spike rate goes down into noise consistent with a mechanism of depolarization block, right? We're recording in loose patch mode here for, for technical reasons, just to look at spike rate. Okay, what about the, the, the differential tuning to irradiance? We actually find that the macaque and the mouse cells cover a very similar range, such that it doesn't appear that uh, the population tuning is suited to the niche of the species. All right, and, and if you were to ask me why I think this might be the case, I would speculate that you know, temporal niche is a, is a flexible thing, right? I can take the night shift, uh, a mouse, if you treat it a certain way, will actually go and be diurnal. Also, irradiance is a, is a crucial uh, parameter. As the Earth turns and irradiance changes, that drives changes in, in visibility, the level of ultraviolet radiation, temperature, the types of species that are out and about. So perhaps no matter what your niche is, it behooves you to, to encode the full range. Okay, so it looks like there's no or very little tuning to um, niche in terms of the intrinsic sensitivities of these IPRGCs. But we do see a prominent difference. And this is the last data slide. I'll just walk you through it. It's really striking. As soon as you put an electrode on a macaque IVRGC, this is the thing that just pops out at you. So, so bear with me for another couple of minutes and I'll, I'll take you through it. Okay, so what we're gonna do is we're gonna look at two cells at the beginning. One is a mouse outer stratifying IPRGC and one is a macaque outer stratifying IPRGC. And they're similar in that they're unimodally tuned to irradiance. They have similar peak firing rates, okay? So let's start with the mouse, and we'll just look at the firing uh, pattern here at this lower intensity, and then here at the higher intensity on the steep part of the tuning curve. So here are the rasters for the low intensity and here for the high intensity. And uh, this is the number of observations of interspike intervals, right? the, the ISI distribution. And so if you look at this, you can convince yourself that these blue spikes are coming from the higher irradiance. There seems to be more of them, but the, the firing is so irregular that you know, you'd have to look for a while to convince yourself that yes, something is different here. And that's reflected in the overlapping ISI distributions. We can formalize this with an ROC analysis. You know, what, what is the proportion of correct choices uh, by an ideal observer that, that they're looking at this spike train or that spike train given the sampling interval? And you can see that there's this, um, gradual rise in the performance of the ideal observer up to unity uh, right around you know, 10 or 20 seconds. So if you can look at these spike trades for long enough, you can tell you know, that the light intensity is different. And this takes a while because it's irregular. Well, what about the macaque cell? Well, here are the rasters. This, you know, this is real data. The spikes are coming with just incredible precision. The inner spike intervals are so, uh, repeatable that you can see you know, the, the difference in these two distributions here. And it's, this precision is such that you know, if you see a couple of interspike intervals go by, you pretty much know that the light intensity has changed. right? It's just that regular. And if we do the same analysis on this macaque cell, we find that even down at 100 milliseconds or so, the, 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 the ROC analysis tells us that you know, it's about 100% performance here. So truly remarkable, this precision in firing. 
Now, if we look across the population, it's, it's not quite as dramatic as these two exemplars, but you can see the macaque cells in black consistently outperform the mouse cells uh, collectively. Okay, so this is a, a difference between the species that is quite prominent. Why? Well, again, if you would ask me, if you asked me to speculate, I would say uh, mice sort of sit there and they don't make many eye movements, right? Why? They don't have a fovea. They don't need to scan the fovea around to build up a high, high, highly detailed representation of the world. They sit there and their eyes move, but not so much, not so frequently. Primates, on the other hand, macaques, humans, uh, we move our eyes constantly to scan that fovea around. In fact, uh, movements are continuous, but big movements, these saccades, happen every couple hundred milliseconds on average. So melanopsin cells do have some contribution to image forming vision. If they are to extract spatial information from the scene, then they, they should be able to do that in the interval between saccades, otherwise you're going to blur out that detail. Right, so here, if you have some IPRTCs that can make, you know, that can, that can, that can tell you uh, what the light intensity is with some confidence within a short interval, then that just fits into um, something that primates do, which is to move their eyes continuously and scan that fovea around. Okay, so that would be our speculation at, at the moment. And these experiments are new, so more analysis is to come. Okay, so let me summarize. The second part of the talk, uh, was about non-image forming vision. We we're looking at IPRGCs, which regulate many aspects of physiology. I showed you data that, that the mouse outer stratifying IPRGCs are tuned to particular light intensities, much like say cones are tuned to particular wavelengths. This, uh, this tuning varies across cells, right? So this differential tuning across the population allows the cells collectively to encode a broad range of intensities from moonlight to full daylight. And uh, there's this funny mechanism here where part of the tuning, the descending limb of that tuning curve comes from this intrinsic depolarization block. This is uh, one of the few cases out there where, where it looks like cells are generating depolarization block to, uh, to shape their, their outputs. Okay, and uh, in macaque outer stratifying IPRGCs, block and differential tuning uh, seems to be conserved. And there is a prominent difference here, which is the precision of firing, which allows uh, you to read out the irradiance uh, within a short time span from the macaque uh, spike pattern. OK, so I mentioned everyone as I went along. Here's the group. This is an old photo. Uh, so it's a classic. I always have to show it. And then some new remembers here. I mentioned uh, experiments that we're doing downstream in the brain now with the superchiasmatic nucleus and Felipe Marquettis is spearheading that. Ed is our resident administrator who keeps us uh, functioning. So uh, with that, I will close and take questions. So thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much for this uh, very interesting and uh, thought-provoking talk. Uh, judging from the uh, scarcity of questions uh, thus far in the chat, I assume either people were captivated by the talk and the data you showed, or they are already thinking about uh, vacation. Uh, I already have an avalanche of questions from Thomas in our personal um, inbox. Uh, and before I uh, delve into this, I would like to uh, encourage people from the audience to ask whatever uh, they want to ask. Uh, I, will, I will stick to your format regarding the two parts. I have one first question from uh, GTS. This is an acronym probably. Uh, he asks, what is your typical specific uh, capacitance? Our typical is one microfarad per centimeter squared in the, the primate cones. We haven't made this, uh, yeah, so we're on the first part of the talk. We haven't looked in the melanopsin cells yet. And Although, this is sorry, this is regarding the first, the photoreceptor part. Yes, that's right. So it's one one microfarad per centimeter square, and it doesn't look like it's different between the foveal and peripheral cones. Mm -hmm. so we're at the textbook value. Um, I was just uh, adding to that by saying that we're also curious about doing this analysis for the melanopsin cells in the second part of the talk. You know, if we look at the cells themselves, they're really quite different between mouse and macaque in their morphology. So. This, you know, this mouse cell and this macaque cell are on the same scale. And so, uh, and yet we see that they have a similar sensitivity, right? And how does that occur? I mean, if this cell is much larger, 
then you might expect it to be capturing photons much more effectively. And yet the sensitivity is pretty much the same. So maybe the electrical architecture of the cell has something to do with it. You know, how well do signals propagate from here down to there? We don't know, right? And the capacitance is one element of that. Mm -hmm. uh, given the relevance, I will jump to a question of the second part from uh, Thomas. These two cells were picked to be uh, homologous only based on their morphology. Yes, so, so morphology is our, is our guiding light here. And now that we have the single cell RNA sequencing data, right, which gives us these clusters, mm -hmm. these various IPRTC types, both in the macaque and the mouse, what we're doing is, is we're looking at uh, markers that are shared between the mouse outer stratifying IPRTCs and the macaque outer stratifying IPRTCs to see if really they are one and the same at the molecular level as well. So I would say that, you know, we started by picking cells that have orthologous uh, morphology, but the physiological results also suggest that they are uh, of a type. It's the molecular uh, part that we're working on now. I see. Uh, I was personally wondering, I mean, we are here, so let's stick here. Uh, given the uh, last uh, data slide that you showed about the different discrimination of irradiance between the macaque and the mouse, could it be that uh, the different uh, mouse IPRGCs are taking over and somehow also contributing to the same uh, code, let's say, that uh, is sent to the brain? So that's why you observe a difference between the two? Uh, I wonder if you could clarify the question. You're, you're wondering if, if there's some uh, convergence among mouse IPRGCs? <laughs> Yeah, so here you're comparing only one type of mouse IPRGC with the macaque, right? That's right. So could it be that the other uh, mouse IPRGCs are uh, talking together with this mouse IPRGC to the same cells upstream? Yeah, that is that is a great question, and it's, it's something that we're interested in. So, you know, right now we don't really have that information. Uh, we don't have, say, uh, information about a postsynaptic cell in the brain receiving convergent inputs from IPRGCs of different types, right? We mm -hmm. don't know the case. Of course, recent work uh, from Botan Roska's lab, from Jinfei Chen's lab, Mark Anderman's lab, suggests that for conventional RGCs, the non-intrinsically photosensitive type, there is convergence among different types onto single postsynaptic neurons. So by analogy, it could exist. And there are at the at the gross level, if you if you look at the projection patterns of the M1 IPRGCs, the outer stratifying ones, and then you look at the projection patterns of all IPRGCs, mm -hmm. then you, you see that there's some overlap, right? And and you can say put a retrograde label into the suprachiasmatic nucleus, look at the RGCs that are upstream, and you find not just the M1 type in the mouse, but also the M2. And this is work that Gary Picker's lab has done. And so the possibility exists that their signals are pooling. And they're probably pooling to different extents, depending on what brain region you're in. So the dorsal LGN gets very little M1 input and a lot of input from the other IPRGC types. And we're just, we're just starting to tease that apart. Right, right now, we lack uh, uh, very effective ways of labeling individual IPRGC types. I see. Yeah. Uh, I have two uh, questions in the chat regarding uh, either the location or the area. Uh, so the first is from Jos Muland. Uh, did you record the location of the IPRGCs in the retina? Is there any correlation between location and sensitivity? Yeah, that's a great one. So, so what I'll say is that, uh, sorry, I'm pouring myself some coffee. <laughs> so, the, uh, so, so first of all, uh, I'm gonna give this, this answer in a, in a couple of parts. The first part is a simple one, which is, we don't see any variation in sensitivity with retinal location. So one thing that we've done is to do paired recordings from IPRGCs that are right next to each other to ask how what their tuning looks like. And what we find with the paired recordings is that you know you see as much variation in sensitivity between neurons that are close to each other as you do across the whole sample. So there's no obvious spatial organization that we've seen. Okay. Um, if you, if you look at the retina, you find, let's say you stain from melanopsin and melanopsin expression level to some degree governs the sensitivity of those cells because the more melanopsin you have, the more photons are captured, right? You find that the, the cells in the ventral retina tend to express much more melanopsin than the cells in the, in the dorsal retina. 
whether that corresponds to sensitivity is, is not clear, but there's some, um, there's some substrate for variation across cells of a type. And most of our recordings concerning the, uh, this differential tuning to irradiance for technical reasons we did in the ventral retina. Okay, and, and the, that reason is if you go back and you look at this depolarization block, right? You look at this and you say, okay, we're recording from the cell body uh, and we don't see spikes. But is that just because the, the dendrites in the cell body are this massive engine for phototransduction? And so they're generating this huge response and spikes are really being initiated in the axon somewhere. And, and the back propagating spikes are just not visible. So we worried that from the perspective of the cell body, we uh, weren't seeing the real outputs of these cells to the brain. And so what Milner did was to um, ignore my advice and then develop a way of recording from the axons of these cells within the retina. So we put a cut near the optic disc, revealed the axons, did axon recordings, and we found that if the cell body is blocked, the axon is also silent, okay? And, and because this is a roundabout way of getting to the answer to your question, but be, because he was recording from axons and the cells in the ventral exp retina express the most melanopsin, and melanopsin is that promoter is what's driving our floor floor. It's just the, the cells in the ventral retina were the most visible to us. And so we targeted their axons and most of our information comes from them. We did some other experiments. So we don't see you know, any spatial organization there. Um, in the dorsal retina, we've done a, a smaller number of experiments. If we did more, maybe we'd see some structure arise. But so far, there's no, there's no uh, spatial organization that we've seen. I see. Thank you very much. Uh, the next one is from Anna Vlasic. Over how large an area of the retina do you have to sample to get the full range of uh, radiance uh, tuning? Is there a mosaic within a certain irradiance level? Yeah, that's, that's a great question. And, and it relates to the, to, to the one that was just asked. <clears throat> We, we don't know. All right, so, so I'll bring up another uh, experimental choice that we made that, that prevents us from having a lot of information here. And that is that uh, we recorded from one cell per retina because we were afraid of cumulative effects of light history, right? So we worried that uh, if we did more than one cell in the retina, that, um, you know, the, the, the desensitization from the first cell would carry over. And we know that these cells adapt and recover from adaptation over very long time scales. And so that prevented us from, from looking at, you know, just looking and seeing, is there some organization there? Another difficulty is that, you know, we've, we've thought about going with 2P, right? Or, or an imaging technique. Uh, so from Tomas's paper uh, on the ICUP scope, right? Published mm -hmm. with uh, Winfred Denk some time ago, the estimate was, that, that just 2P scanning gives you 10 to the four uh, activated rhodopsins per rod per second, right? So that is already an intensity that would um, drive most of these IPRTCs into depolarization block. So 2P is not great for this kind of analysis, right? So uh, right here, so here's, well, here's 10 to the four. So maybe not most of them, but it is, it is driving some, some desensitization here. Right, so we we've hesitated to use that, and we're we're looking on, into other imaging techniques to uh, look at the organization of these cells. And and one thing that we're interested in is, you know, we're sampling one cell at a time. It, what is the what is the population representation? Are there certain light intensities, say those that at twilight, uh, that are particularly salient to the organism that are overrepresented in this population, and uh, you know, we haven't, uh, we have, we're, we're still moving along trying to make some technical developments there. Thank you very much for elaborating uh, on these questions. It's really useful, especially for uh, new people in the field to get a better uh, understanding as well. I have another question from uh, Cyril Eleftheriou. Uh, is it likely that local inner retinal circuits influence tuning of individual IPR disease or population uh, subtypes? That is a, that is a great question. So uh, I would guess yes, that, that, uh, that retinal circuitry can influence tuning. So uh, the, let's see, first of all, these cells are intrinsically photosensitive, but they are receiving input from rod and cone pathways, right? So uh, at, at low light levels, then 
uh, their firing is going to be, be influenced mostly by, by rod photoreceptors, right? Cones mm -hmm. make a contribution to the firing of these cells as well. So, so that can certainly influence their tuning. Now, uh, when people have, have queried the influence of various photoreceptor types to the output of an IPRDC, rods, cones, and melanopsin, right, their, their intrinsic response, when they've queried that, there's evidence that, that there could be a, a bit of a winner-take-all for melanopsin phototransduction, where once you activate melanopsin phototransduction, it tends to dominate the outputs of these neurons. So melanopsin phototransduction tends to come on in higher light levels and over longer durations. And so those are the parameters that we're investigating here, right? Long durations, steady firing, where we think melanopsin might be uh, dominating the response in some of these cells anyway. So, so there is probably an influence in shaping the tuning curves of these cells, but it's, it's a dynamic influence. And under the conditions that we've examined, I, I think that the conditions that we examined do speak to how these cells function physiologically when you don't block synaptic transmission and, and all of those influences are intact. We're doing more experiments along these lines now where we very carefully preserve rod photosensitivity, cone photosensitivity, and then look at how these uh, tuning curves change. Uh, it looks like we're preserving drug adaptation well with our with our methods. Uh, you know, we we look at alpha ganglion cells, which have a very defined threshold. They're the most sensitive cells in the retina, as, as uh, Adriala Lorilla's recent work shows, and we find that that threshold hasn't changed. So we think we have a nicely dark adapted retina there. And when we look at the IPRGCs, what we're finding is that this uh, differential tuning to irradiance is still there. There's some, there's some variability across the population. Uh, some IPRGCs receive a huge amount of synaptic input. And uh, if we block it, then of course their tuning changes dramatically. But other IPRGCs have very little dependence on synaptic input. And you, you can see that it's there, but it doesn't make an, a, a, a discernible contribution to their spiking. So, so there are some cells that, that behave almost like autonomous photoreceptors and some that behave more like uh, conventional ganglion cells. And overall, I think that this picture will hold with some nuance when we incorporate the synaptic transmission. Awesome. Um, due to time's economy, the next question will be the last one that I would politely ask you to address uh, in the live session. Uh, and after that, I would like to remind to the audience that the link is already available for the Zoom room that we are already sitting in. Uh, do not hesitate if you want to join for a casual discussion or for more questions regarding the talk. The link uh, is already there. The last question is from Jan, if I'm not uh, mispronouncing it. Uh, do IPRGCs also engage in retrograde uh, signaling? Oh, uh, yeah. Great question. So it turns out that a fraction of the M1 IPRGCs have axon collaterals within the retina. Okay, so. Um, this, this is an observation that's been made in the, in the primate retina by Dennis Dacey and in, in the mouse retina by uh, folks in Samar Hattar's group uh, at Hopkins. And um, you can, you know, these, these, the, the, the axon bifurcates, there's a local axon collateral, and, and in some cases it can, it can uh, cover a fair amount of territory. I would say that the, you know, what this collateral is doing, the jury's still out. The present thinking in the field is that it could be responsible for regulating dopamine levels in the retina. So uh, IPRGCs, so if you, if you have a retina from a mouse that has no rods, no cones whatsoever, you can still get a modulation of the firing rate of the dopaminergic amacrine cells. And that seems to be chemical synaptic transmission from the IPRGCs and these uh, axon collaterals could be the substrate for that. Okay. Um, thank you very much. Thanks to one, everyone. One, one, one more thing. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Yeah, yeah sorry. Sorry, I, I, can't, I can't. I can't resist. Uh, <laughs> another another thing that the IPRGCs do is is make gap junctions with with uh, displaced amacrine cells. So uh, they can also influence retinal circuitry in that way, right? So so you can imagine, and this is something that that I I find really intriguing. I'd love to follow up on it, which is that the cells are 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 sending action potentials to the brain, but then they're sending these subthreshold analog responses out in the retina. And so they could be multiplexing signals, right? A cell that's in depolarization block, that's not sending spikes to the brain, could still be uh, sending graded changes in voltage through electrical synapses. And um, 
you know, the, the, there's much work to be done there. Okay. I'll <laughs> Thank you very much for all these uh, insights in your field of uh, expertise. Uh, once again, the link is available. Uh, thank you very much for tuning in. Thank you very much, Professor Do, for this uh, thought-provoking talk. Uh, and if I'm not mistaken, this is the last uh, worldwide neuro talk we will be hosting uh, for this uh, time. We will take a short break for summer vacation and we will be coming back uh, mid-September uh, with the next talks, if I'm not mistaken. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. And now I assume that uh, 